Let's get into it. Mark chapter 11, go down to verse 22. Then Jesus said to the disciples, have faith in God. I tell you the truth, you can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen. And have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against. So that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. As we begin the teaching of God's holy word today, uh, let's just take a moment to pray. I just sense in my spirit as I've been reading this that there are going to be individuals uh, who are watching this broadcast that really are feeling hopeless and you're battling waves of discouragement and despair and you're overwrought with the thoughts of what's going to happen tomorrow and, and uh, are we living in the last moments of time and would I be ready to meet the Lord and there's panic and fear. And I just feel to pause and I want to pray for you that the presence of God and the peace of God that passes all understanding will be yours. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we open up the Holy Bible once again today, we thank you that you hear the cries of your people. You said oftentimes in the Bible, call upon me and I will answer you. And so today we call. I pray and I ask specifically for those that are watching this broadcast and even the questions that have come in multiplied times over, people who through private messaging have opened up their heart and said outright, I'm afraid. I don't know what's going on. I've never been taught the Bible. What is going to happen to me? Are we living in the book of Revelation? And people's hearts are overwhelmed with all of the uncertainties of our chaotic world. But I thank you. I think of that song from Sunday school as a little boy that simply said, He's got the whole world in his hands. And we praise you that in these last days that the powers of wickedness and sin and disease and plague and corrupt governments and those who have other agendas, that they are not in control. But we praise you today that you as our Heavenly Father are in control, and that nothing can happen unless you allow it to happen. I pray for those who need the peace of God, that first of all, if they're not saved, let today be the day that they turn from sin and turn to Christ. I pray, Father, that those that are struggling with fear, that you would help them to not overload on all of the negativity in the news and the media. I pray that you would give them the ability to pull back from all of their carnal curiosities and to find time in the Word, in the presence of God, in prayer. And I ask you now that they might feel the literal presence of the Lord come to where they're at, overshadow them, overshadow their homes and their families. And I pray that you would give them a trust. Let these broadcasts strengthen their faith, and help them to know what their divine rights are in Christ Jesus the Lord. We are living in the last days, but we thank you that those who are in Christ, we must remember the words of the Apostle Paul who taught to the church in Thessalonica, in light of all of these things that are going to happen, encourage one another with these words. Because for the believer, the last days is a message of courage and hope 
and fulfillment because we are in the presence of God and living under the shadow of the wing of the Almighty. And no evil shall befall us. No plague shall come nigh our dwelling. No disease, sickness, or infirmity has a right to attach itself to the child of God living in your covenant. Help me to make that truth clear today. And may people find salvation and strength. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. For we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus and give you praise. And all God's people said, Amen. Now I mentioned to you that I'd give you just a brief foundation as to where we were at so that we can start today and I'm going to keep it, keep it brief. But for those of you that are just tuning in and you have not yet taken the time to watch the previous broadcast, Hurdles on the Road to Divine Healing Part 1. This is Hurdles on the Road to Divine Healing Part 2. In Part 1, we did our best to explain to you what I might call Divine Healing 101. And one of the scriptures that you need to have in your Bible and in your notes is Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. In the New Living Translation, here's what it says. Everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. Now why is that so vital? It's important because it gives us the benchmark to build our faith upon. Everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. So anytime you have a question, well, I wonder if this is the will of God. I wonder if it's the will of God for me to be saved. I wonder if it's the will of God for me to be healed. I wonder if it's the will of God for me to succeed. I wonder if it's the will of God for me to survive this pandemic. And whatever your question is, Hebrews 1.3 is the foundation upon what you must turn to. Everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. If you are going to be, and this is more powerful than I can give it in words. If you are going to be powerful in your faith, you must have a working knowledge of the life of Jesus Christ. Your ability to walk in the supernatural will only be as large as your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. As your knowledge of Jesus Christ increases from the Bible, your ability to walk in the supernatural will grow side by side. You cannot walk in the supernatural in a dimension that's higher than your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Hebrews 1.3, in a way, is undergirding. Everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. So when someone comes to me and says, I'm struggling because I don't know what the will of God is concerning my ABC situation, then I know that they don't know Christ well enough to apply Christ-likeness to their situation. Now, I don't say that condescendingly. I don't say that judgmentally. I say that in all love. If you want to be powerful in the supernatural, you must be powerful in your knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's why John 3.30 is something that I emphasized in last broad, the last broadcast repeatedly. In John 3.30, the Bible says, He must increase, I must decrease. And so the whole process of your journey in faith is dependent upon your ability to crucify your carnal nature and to be more like Jesus Christ every day. Many believers only try to live like Jesus Christ on Sunday, and then they live like themselves Monday through Saturday. 
But the believer that walks in the power of God lives like Jesus every day and more like Jesus with every passing month and year. So again, don't forget that. Everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. So when we have questions in our life, we need to be able to take those questions, open up our Bibles, and lay them over the pattern of Jesus Christ. Because He not only was the Son of God, He is the standard upon which we must move forward in our journey of faith. Now, we taught on that in the first broadcast. I'll not get back into the depth that I did in the first broadcast. But here's the second thing in the foundation that I want you to remember. That God always builds the model upon perfection. Do you remember me teaching that on the last broadcast? God's model, God's standard will always be built and taught in your Bible upon the standards of perfection. And I taught you. God said, be thou perfect even as I am perfect. Well, no one is perfect, but that's God's standard. God said, be, you, be thou holy, even as I am holy. God wants you to be holy, just as holy as He is. But you're not, and I'm not. No one is as holy as the Lord God Almighty. But nonetheless, in the Scripture, it says, be thou holy, even as as I am holy. So I don't want that to frustrate you. I want you to understand why God does that. Well, theologically, there's multiple reasons, but let me at least give you the main reasons. You were created in the image of God, Genesis chapter 1. You were created in the image of God. So if God created you in His image, then His image and all of His attributes are His standards for you and for I. Why would He create you in His image and then ask you to live in the image of something lesser? God doesn't want you to live in the image of something lesser. And many of you continually fill your eye gates with celebrities and people and entertainment and you keep putting into your eye gate a lesser standard. And because you're constantly valuing a lesser standard, then you are living a lesser life. And if you are living a lesser life, then you will not operate in the power of the supernatural in the way that God intended for you to operate. You're going to have to make decisions. And am I going to go through life feeding the good dog or the bad dog? Say, what do you mean by that? I oftentimes use that as an illustration because I know that even children that watch this broadcast will understand that. Uh, in Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8, Paul basically teaches us there that though we are Christians, we live in a body of flesh. And because we live in a body of flesh, we have a carnal nature, a fleshly nature. And that fleshly nature is always in a tug of war between the things of the flesh and the things of the spirit. So think of your flesh as a bad dog and think of your spirit man because you have an eternal spirit. When God created you in His image, just as they uh, show us in Scripture, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, uh, oftentimes called the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. We see it evidenced in the Scripture on several occasions uh, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. Jesus was there as He came up out of the water. And the Bible said that a dove like the Spirit descended upon Him and the voice of the Father said, This is My Son in whom I am well pleased. In that baptismal story, we see God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. You have a triune makeup because you were made in the image of God. 
You have body, mind, and spirit. And because you were created in the image of God, you have been called to walk in the standards of God, not in the standards of your flesh. So always remember that your flesh is the bad dog. Your spirit, made in the image and the likeness of God, is what you must feed. But you're going to have to make simple, disciplined choices. If you feed your flesh more than you feed your spirit, then you're not ever going to walk in the potential of the supernatural that's available to you. Now this is important because this is one of the reasons why people say, well, how come all Christians don't get healed? There are multitudes of reasons why not all Christians walk in divine healing. But this would be one of them, and I'm going to be teaching specifically on three, but I'll throw this one in for free. But this is one of the reasons why. You can be a born-again Christian, but have terrible spiritual disciplines. That's why the Bible says in Revelation that when you stand before God in the believer's judgment, that all of your life and all of your works and all of your motives are going to be tested by fire. And only that which was righteous will remain. And many Christians get saved, but they don't grow in their faith. They spend way too much time feeding the flesh and not enough time feeding the spirit. Now, it's going to get real personal. I'm going to step on a lot of toes, but I'm going to give you an example. If you never read your Bible and you never pray, and people say, well, how often should I pray? Uh, Jesus said in Luke 13, men ought always to pray and not to faint. The book of Proverbs says in the third chapter, don't trust your own understanding in life. Don't trust your own understanding in life. But in all your ways, acknowledge Him. That's prayer. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. You should pray and talk to God about everything you do. And you should have daily time in the Bible. And I'm always asked the question, which is more important, reading my Bible or my life in prayer? And I always respond by telling people, if you're on a train... Which track is more important, the left rail or the right rail? And the obvious answer is that if either rail is damaged, there's going to be a train wreck. You must be a person, both of the word, and you must be a person of prayer. You must, if you want to walk in the supernatural. And many people don't have faith. Many people walk in in the nature of the flesh, many people struggle with their old friends and their old habits because they never spend any time in the Word, they rarely spend time in prayer, and they sit on their blessed assurance and watch Netflix hours at a time. And then they wonder why they don't have the ability to exercise the potential of the supernatural in Christ Jesus the Lord. If you want to walk in high places, in the Lord Jesus Christ, and in the power of His might, then you're going to have to make some difficult choices. And one of those choices is you're going to have to do a self-evaluation of how much time in my life am I feeding the bad dog, and how much time am I feeding the good dog. You know, uh, social media has opened up an entire view of the world uh, that I didn't have in the infancy of my ministry, for example. And by the way, uh, I'm seeing that, and uh, there's nothing I can do about it. Many people are wanting to follow us on Facebook, and I say this all the time, but I just saw it this week. There are literally hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of requests piled up on my Facebook friends page. They limit that to 5,000. So I can't take any more friends on my personal Facebook page. Please, if you want to follow this ministry on Facebook, go to our ministry page. And that's Tiff Shuttlesworth-Lost Lamb Association. Uh, they allow 
uh, unlimited numbers of followers on the ministry page, but not on the friends page. So if you have not done that already, uh, do that today when the broadcast is over. Follow Tiff Shuttlesworth Dash Lost Lamb Association. That's our Facebook ministry page. That's where all of these broadcasts uh, originate from. Just a little bit of housekeeping there. But here's the point. I've had all of these Christians from various churches where I've ministered through the years that follow me. And uh, as a result, a lot of times their posts are scrolling and available on Facebook. And I see them in the bars and I see them drinking and I see them posting lustful pictures and I see them hanging out with losers and I see their eyes crossed with drunkenness and they wonder why they don't walk in the power of God. Don't miss what I'm about to say. If you're taking notes, write this down. There is a price tag to the supernatural. There is a price tag to the supernatural. If you want to walk in the power of God, you must walk powerfully with God. If you're going to continue to hang out in bars and clubs and drink and party and live with your boyfriend or live with your girlfriend and involve yourself in the sins of this world and go to church on Sunday and sing Amazing Grace, you are never going to have available to you the potential of the supernatural that God intended for you to have. Is that too tough? I say that to you as a father. I say that to you because I love you. Some of you need a wake-up call. And this pandemic has given you a wake-up call. And many of you realize, I'm not even sure. Do you know how many people have private messaged me in recent days who have said, I have tried to live a Christian life or something like this. I have tried to live a Christian life. I, I, I've gone through years thinking that I was a Christian, but this pandemic has has made me wonder, would I really be ready to meet the Lord if He came? And the truth is, for some of you, no. You would not be ready. You're like the parable of the ten virgins. Five were wise and five were foolish. Five of them let their fire go out. Five of them did not value the oil. And many of you have let your fire go out, and you've had no value for the oil, the Holy Spirit. And I love you enough to tell you today, you need to listen to the end of this broadcast and you need to pray and come home to Jesus today. I am not judging you, but if you've not watched our broadcast before, I make no attempts to make people happy or to be politically correct. I've had pastors by, I don't know how many, in the last two weeks that have contacted me. And, and, and can I say something? Support and be gracious to your pastor. Many of them are taking hell because they're not having church. Many of them are taking hell because they're having church. And they're being judged no matter what they do. People are being very severe. There's no profit to that. Romans chapter 14 says there is no profit in arguing with your brothers and sisters in Christ. So don't be harsh. Don't be mean-spirited. Don't be arrogant. Don't be judgmental. Because no matter what your pastor does, some of the people in the church are going to love him for it and some of the people in the church are going to criticize him for it. I just keep telling all of the pastors, if you want a job that makes everybody happy, sell ice cream. If you want a job that makes everybody happy, sell ice cream. But in the ministry, there are always going to be people that love you and people that criticize you. That's just the way it goes. But if you follow this ministry, I hope I set the, this example. You've never heard me one time. You've never heard me one time. If you followed me for 40 years, you've never heard me one time slander anybody's ministry publicly. Because God doesn't have any defense attorneys. God gave five callings to the church. 
He gave the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. And that's found in Ephesians chapter 4, if you've never studied it. Those are the five spiritual giftings that God gave to the church. Notice that none of them are defense attorney. God can take care of His own. God judge, judges wickedness. Now, biblically, there is a time for mentioning names. Paul did. So it is not completely biblical to say that we can never deal with false teaching or heretics or division in the church. Paul did. But that should be a rare occasion. Support your pastor. Pray for your pastor. Don't forget those of you that are Christians during this time when uh, most churches are closed. Don't forget to support your church and to be faithful with your tithes and your offerings because you're not just giving to support a church. You are literally proving through your giving that you're faithful to God in tough times. And if you're faithful to God in tough times, God will be faithful to you in tough times. But if you think that you can neglect the house of God and then expect God's full blessing upon your life in a pandemic, you might have a wake-up call ahead of you. Be faithful. Well, let me move on. Let's close the broadcast today by talking about three specific hurdles on the road to divine healing. Now again, if you have not already heard part one, let me bring back to your, remember, uh, your, mem your memory, pardon the glitch there, let me bring back to your memory the visualization of a target. Now remember, God's standard is always what? Perfection. Why? Because He's perfect and you were created in His image. So God's model, God's standard is always going to be taught in the Bible from the perspective of perfection. Now, that's why I ask you to visualize a target. If in your mind you visualize a target, where on the target is perfection? Perfection on a target is the center of the bullseye. That's perfection. The center of the bullseye. That's perfection. So think of any teaching that's in the Bible and visualize a target. Because not everybody lives out the teachings of Christ in perfection. But you, don't miss this, you must always keep yourself on a trajectory of moving towards the center of God's target. For example, there are people that get saved and... Uh, you know, let's say someone got saved in a lost lamb crusade last month and they've only been saved for a handful of days and they've had very little teaching in the Bible. So they're just literally starting from the outside ring. They have no model. They have no teaching. They have no standard until they begin to expose themselves to a good Bible-believing pastor and a good Bible-believing church. By the way, if you're a Christian... You should be faithful to a good Bible-believing church and have a good Bible-believing pastor. Very, very important. It's a part of God's chain of command and don't ignore it. Now listen carefully. The Bible said, To whom much is given, much shall also be required. So the more of the Bible that you have been taught, the more God holds you responsible for moving into the standard of that teaching. In other words, if I were to go out and uh, go to a club and get drunk, the judgment on me, the requirements that God would hold me to, would be far more severe than the person that just got saved last month and no one has taught them anything yet. They're just beginning their walk with Christ. God would give to them more mercy. He would still convict them. He would still draw them. He would still forgive them. 
But that individual who has little to no teaching will not be held to the same standards of conviction and judgment to those who have long, deep teachings. I have no excuse. I have no excuse. And some of you that are listening to me have little to no excuse. But again, visualize that target and let's take divine healing and let's lay it on the target. Let's walk through the process that I taught you earlier. Hebrews 1.3, everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. So the question is divine healing in time of plague or in times in my life or your life when you're battling sickness, disease, or infirmity. Let's take divine healing as a biblical sub subject. Let's lay it upon the target of Hebrews 1.3. If everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly, what is the will of God exactly seen in the life of Jesus Christ on the subject of divine healing? And we've asked these questions. Let me go through them quickly again. Was Jesus ever sick? We have no story, no record anywhere in the Bible of Jesus ever being sick. Were the 12 disciples ever sick? We have no record of the 12 disciples once they begin to walk in intimate fellowship with Jesus. We have no record of them ever being sick. Now, we have no record of any of them dying from sickness or disease. Now, the obvious answer to that is most of them were martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. So they didn't live out full lives. But nonetheless... I'm trying to think of how deep I want to go with this because I don't want to lose people because many of the questions that are coming in are from people that are brand new in the Bible and I don't want to lose them. So let me do my best to clarify this. There is a law of proximity in the Bible. What is the law of proximity? The law of proximity is the closer you get to Jesus the more of the supernatural power of the Lord Jesus that operates in your life. One of the great stories in the Bible that would illustrate that would be the story of the woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years. And the Bible said in Mark's gospel that for 12 years she was hopeless. She had spent all of her money. She had sought out every medical availability. But the Bible said grew worse but she said within herself, if I can just but touch the hem of his garment, I know I will be made well. And that wonderful story, it's not a parable, it actually happened. Notice that she said within herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. So the Bible tells us that this woman, though she was infirmed, pressed through the crowd and got to the point where she was close enough that she reached out and touched the hem of the garment of Jesus Christ. And the Bible said that in that moment she was made completely well. Well, there would be a Bible story that would help us, and there are many, that would help us to understand that the closer you get to Jesus, the greater the supernatural power of the Lord Jesus works in your life. The more of the Bible that you know, the more of the supernatural that will flow. Can I say it again? The more of the Bible that you know, the more of His power will flow. God's power is His Word. He sent His Word, Psalm 103, He sent His Word and healed them and delivered them from all their destructions. All their diseases, one translation says. So I'm not going to teach on that, but that would be the doctrine of proximity. The closer you get to the Lord, the greater the manifestations and the greater the miracles. So if you want to walk in the standards of the supernatural, you've got a purpose in your heart as a believer. I'm going to draw close to the Word and I'm going to draw close to the Lord. 
And the more you know about the Bible, the more you'll know about the power of God. All right, let me close the broadcast by covering what I would say are three of the most common hurdles on the road to divine healing. And if you're taking notes, number one, unbelief. People don't believe. Well, your belief factor, again, lay everything on the target. Where is your belief? If, if you were to lay it on the standard of God's target, where the bullseye is perfect, unwavering belief, and the outside rings are weak belief and a tendency to sometimes doubt. Where would you be on the target of belief? Because the full capacity operates based upon how close you are to the bullseye. Now, in our text that I read to you, Mark chapter 11, if you have your Bibles, just flip back to where we were at. Mark chapter 11, Jesus said to the disciples, verse 22, have faith in God. I tell you the truth, you can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen, but you must really believe it will happen, and have no doubt in your heart. Now, I'm going to, again, give you a very, what I would consider fundamental illustration, where most people fail in unbelief. The main reason why people can't really believe God for their healing, really believe God for their health, really believe God for their finances, really believe God for their marriage, really believe God for their job, really believe God for their future, really believe God in a pandemic. Because many of you have been shaken by this pandemic and you've had to stare where you're really at in God. And some of you are learning through this pandemic that you had more faith in your mouth than you had in your heart. Because your worries and your concerns and your doubts and the things of unbelief and anxiety and, and all of the things that you're saying are proving to you that you're not as settled in your faith as you think you are. Now that's a good thing because that helps us to understand there's room for improvement. So here's one of the main reasons why. Somebody asked me this question. If God's will is for his children to live in divine healing, how come brother so-and-so is in the hospital and dying of this pandemic? He's a godly man. How do you explain that? If it is God's will for people to be healed, his children to be healed. Now let me clarify. I don't want to assume that you know this. We're talking about believers. If you're not a Christian, you have no access to divine healing. If you've never repented of sin and followed Christ, you don't have the availability of this covenant. You have to be a child of God. You know, I have a son, I have a daughter, I have grandchildren, and if my children or my grandchildren, unannounced, were to come to my house and walk in the house and open my refrigerator and help themselves or come into my house and, and make themselves comfortable, there would be no problem whatsoever. I would be thrilled to see them. What a surprise. So glad you're here. I'd give them a hug hard enough to break some ribs. No problem. But if somebody that I don't know walks into my house and starts to take advantage of my property, my possessions, that's not going to end well. That's not going to end well. And if you've never repented of sin and you've never received Jesus Christ, then you don't have access to the blessings of God. You don't have access to the covenant of God. This is another very hard scripture, but again, I love you enough to tell you the truth, and this is what the Bible says. The Bible said in the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, 
Either your father is God or your father is the devil. Wow. How's that for straight down the middle of the highway? Either your father is God or your father is the devil. So if you're listening to me today, if God is your father, you have access to the covenant and to the covenant rights that I'm teaching on, specifically divine healing. But if you're not a child of God, then the Bible says your father is the devil. And John 10 says that he comes to steal and kill and to destroy. But once you become a child of God through repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ, then you have the ability to avail yourself to all of his precious promises. But if you're not living for the Lord, you're still under the curse of sin you're still under the curse of sickness. You're still under the curse of lack. And every other curse under the curse of sin. So the Bible said for the believer, you've got to believe. Now, again, this is not going to be easy for some of you. But if you're going to learn, you have to be willing to listen to biblical teaching. Here's why many people don't believe. And I'm not judging anybody. I'm not judging anyone. I'm just telling you biblically, Jesus said, if you're going to receive this, you've got to believe in your heart and have no doubt, and you also have to have a heart that is free from all unforgiveness and bitterness. That's what Jesus taught us. So if you're a believer and you're still asking questions, like, why is so-and-so in the hospital with COVID-19? They're such a godly person. Now, again, no judgment. But if you're still asking that question, that reveals to me a serious faith problem, and here's what it is. Now, don't get ruffled in your feathers. This will help you. You are, and you'll understand this. This is not going to be hard for you to understand. It might be hard to receive, but it's not going to be hard to understand. You are holding life's experiences. This is what happened to me. This is what happened to so-and-so. Why did this happen to our pastor? Why did this happen to a godly person? My grandmother's the godliest person I ever knew in my entire life. How come she died with... You're taking all of your life experiences and you're holding the Bible co-equal. You're saying, literally, out of your mouth, you're saying... The Bible says this, but how come this happened? That's what you're doing. Co-equal. You are holding the Bible and your life's experiences as co-equal. If you, as a believer, are holding the integrity of the Bible and life's questions in co-equal position then you have doubt in your heart. Again, no condemnation. I'm just telling you that if you want to move to a different level and the application of the supernatural, here's what you must do. And every believer must do this. There has to be a time in your life when you see what the Bible says and by faith, you take the Bible and in declaration to your father, you say, Father, from this day forward, no matter what my mind doubts, no matter what my mind does not understand, I choose to place the Bible above all of my life experiences, above all of my life questions, above all of my misunderstandings, and I choose to believe the Bible above all. And when you're comparing life experiences and saying, well, the Bible says this, but how do you explain that? You've got an issue of co-equal. You have not allowed the Bible to ascend to the proper chain of command that it needs to be in your heart. In other words, so-and-so that you love that was a godly person, as an example, died of cancer. That's, that's a fact. That's a medical fact. I'm not denying that. And by the way, this is helpful for some of you to understand. Jesus Christ did not die on the cross 
for fictitious sin and fictitious sickness. He died on the cross for real sin and he died on the cross for real sickness, disease, and infirmity. So what does that mean? Now, the closer, again, remember the, the visualization of the target with the multiple rings. And remember, God's standard is perfection. So when you teach on salvation, you have to teach it by the bullseye standard. What's the bullseye standard of salvation? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Salvation is available for all who trust in Christ. All. The bullseye is all. Available for all. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the bullseye for salvation is all. If salvation, and I say if, it's factual, it's biblical, it's true. If salvation and healing are the same work, and maybe some of you have never been taught that, pardon me for not taking time to go down the layers of teaching that now, perhaps we'll come back to that, but salvation and healing are not two separate works. They are the same Greek word and they happened on the same place at the same time through the same person, Jesus Christ the Lord. And the same blood that was spilt for the forgiveness of our sins, the stripes upon his back, were laid there for the healing of all who believe. So there's a center in divine healing that has to be answered. If salvation is available to all, then healing has to be available to all. Notice I didn't say all receive it, but it's available to all because not everybody re receives salvation. Not everybody receives the truth of divine healing. I had uh, two yesterday that asked the same question. They said, uh, we love your broadcast. One said, we sat with, your, with our family, watched your broadcast, enjoying them so much. But we have never heard any teaching on divine healing like you've been teaching, and we're fascinated because the church that we go to, and they mentioned the denomination of the church that they uh, attend, they said, our church has never taught anything like that. How come? Well, let me graciously tell you that there are many denominations that don't believe that healing is for today. There are many denominations that don't believe that the fullness of the Holy Spirit is for today. There are many denominations who do not believe that the baptism in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues is for today. Even though Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13, If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. The Apostle Paul clearly taught us. Post upper room. The upper room is where the baptism in the Holy Spirit was for, first poured out upon 120 believers. Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. Read those two chapters when you get a chance. But it did not stop there. And it did not stop with the 12 disciples. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. Praying in tongues, praying in a heavenly language... Some would say, oh, people that do that are crazy. People that do that are demon-possessed. That's not for today. Do I look like somebody that's an idiot? Do I look like somebody that's out of their mind? Do I look like somebody that's demon-possessed? I have served the Lord for 40 years. I have carried out the calling of an evangelist for over 40 years in over 56 countries of the world. Do you think that the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues that I received as an innocent six-year-old child in a Holy Ghost meeting made me more like the devil or more like Jesus? If the baptism in the Holy Ghost is of the devil, it's made me a prolific soul winner. If the baptism in the Holy Ghost is of the devil, it has given me an incredible passion to win lost people to Jesus Christ. 
If the baptism in the Holy Ghost is of the devil, it has given me an incredible, insatiable desire to know the Bible, to learn the Bible, and to teach the Bible. If the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of a heavenly language is of the devil, it has given me a desire to be more like Jesus and less like myself. Obviously, I'm being sarcastic. If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. And it's a way of building your faith. I always tell people, when you get saved, the second goal you should have is to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Number two, open doors. We're talking about three major battlefields where people struggle with divine healing. Number one is unbelief. And many believe it in their head, and some even believe it in their heart. But they've never crucified the co-equal analysis of saying, Father, whatever happens in this world, I don't care if I don't understand it. I don't care if it doesn't make sense to my intellect. I, by faith, place the Bible and what the Word of God says over my life above all. Number two, open doors. In Ephesians chapter 4 and uh, down around verse 27, the Bible said, Give no place to the enemy or give no place to the devil. The NIV, I believe, uses the word uh, foothold. Give no foothold to the enemy. Uh, one version uses give no opportunity. Let me just teach you on that for a moment before we close. When the Bible says give no place to the enemy, how do you give a place to the enemy? And of course, you know, our Bible that uh, we're teaching out of today, uh, my native tongue is English, my Bible is an English version, but the word from the manuscript, the original manuscript uh, in Ephesians 4 uh, was written in Greek. And when it says give no place, the word place translated English from the Greek is the word topos, T-O-P-O-S. It's where we get the English word uh, topography. And many of you have seen maps, topography maps. I use them when I go off grid and uh, a compass and a, and, and a map, an accurate topography map. Very important to know my place. Give no place to the devil. If you don't know beyond the shadow of a doubt what God's will is in the subject of divine healing, then there are places for the devil to attack. There will always be places in your life that the enemy is going to attack. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, why don't, I, why don't I take the time to read it? Ephesians 4 and uh, verse 26. The Bible says, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are angry, for anger gives a foothold, tapos, to the devil. Anger gives a place. Resentment, gossip, lies, drunkenness, dishonesty, profanity, unforgiveness, even not forgiving yourself. All of these give a foothold, a topos, a place. All right, let me summarize this. Any place in your faith where you don't know what the Bible teaches, gives the devil a place, like an open gate. It gives an open gate where the enemy is going to test you there. That's where he'll attack. He's not going to attack the big gate that you've got buttoned up and sealed and secure. I know I'm saved. I know I gave my heart to Jesus. I know Jesus loves me in spite of my imperfect. And you've got your salvation settled. But divine healing, you've got some gates that you haven't settled with good Bible teaching, with a good Bible teacher. You have not settled certain issues on divine healing. And any place that there's doubt, anger, resentment, 
unbelief, unforgiveness, etc. The Bible says you've allowed a tapos. You've allowed a place where the gates open. And wherever the gates are open in the weakness of your knowledge of doctrine, that's where the devil's always going to attack. He's always going to attack your tapos. Your place where you haven't sealed the gate and made it sure by the absolute unshakable knowledge of what does God will for me. said it before, I'm going to say it again. Doctrinally, not just theologically, logically. If salvation is available for all, then divine healing has to be available for all. And just as all do not receive salvation, all do not receive divine healing. Let me say that again. Just as many people have never received and believed for salvation, there are many believers who have sat under poor teaching and they have not believed nor received the proper way of shutting the gate for their health. And there is an open gate, there's a tapos, there's a place where the devil will always attack you. Because if you don't know if it's God's will for you to be healed or not, again, Hebrews 1.3, everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. Was Jesus ever sick? No. Did Jesus ever make anybody sick? No. Did Jesus ever tell anybody their sickness was sent from God? No. Did Jesus ever teach or tell anybody that sickness strengthens your faith? Never. Did Jesus ever refuse to heal anybody that came to him in childlike faith? Never. So there's the bullseye. There's the bullseye. But some of you are not in the bullseye yet. And I'm not, again, no condemnation. I'm just challenging you. That is the purity and the standard of divine healing. It's available for all. Now, some of you are on various rings. Some of you that are listening to me, very few of us are in the center of that bullseye in our understanding. But if you're going to walk in the supernatural power of God, you know, like somebody said, well, you know, my pastor was a, a godly man and he, you know, he, he died when he was 44. How do you explain that? Well, number one, I never take a life experience and hold it as co-equal to what the Bible says. I always say, that's what the Bible said. I know that God didn't fail. I know that God's Word didn't fail. I don't know, and I'm not going to judge if you had a pastor that died of a terminal disease in their 40s and was the godliest person you'd ever met. I'm not going to judge them, but I'm not going to take their life circumstance and make it co-equal to what the Bible says. You know, somebody asked me that the other day about a godly leader in a, de in a denomination. Well, I was loving enough and gracious enough that I didn't answer. But in my heart, I knew that denominational leader, and I knew they taught against divine healing. I knew what they taught on divine healing. They didn't believe what I'm showing you in the Bible today. They didn't teach that. They believed that God sends sickness. That he's sovereign. If he wants to send sickness upon you, he's sovereign. You've got to trust him. You can't even imagine how hot that makes me under the collar when I hear spiritual leaders teach that. Because every time somebody hears that, oh, a gate, a tapos, has been taught into their Christian walk that throws a gate wide open, that every time sickness hits them, they don't know whether to believe God for healing or whether God's trying to make them more like Jesus, and so they just accept it. They certainly can't pray with faith. They, they certainly can't obey the teaching of Jesus in Mark 11. When you believed, have no doubt in your heart. They have doubt in their heart. Their pastor taught them to doubt. If you believe and have no doubt in your heart, regardless of what happens in my life, even Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. An Old Testament believer who never knew the Lord Jesus, never sat under his teaching. He walked close enough to the fellowship and the presence of God in his life 
that he said even in the old covenant where healing was not available then as it is available now, he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job said, I'll never take one of my life experiences and hold it as co-equal to the trust that I have in God. Very, very, very important. So sometimes, and again, I'm not judging anybody. There are multitudes of reasons why people don't live in the bullseye of divine healing. But I can tell you this. Biblically, if salvation is available to all, then if you're a child of God, you have the right to seek God for health all the days of your life. Because he said in Psalm 91, with long life, I will satisfy thee. I close with this words. One of the biggest hurdles on the road to divine healing is people's words betray the Bible. Turn to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. And verse 20. My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Highlight that in your Bible. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart. For they bring life to those who find them. And healing to their whole body. God's words, the book of Proverbs says, let them penetrate into your heart. For they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. God's words, even in the Old Covenant, had power when they were in a man's heart. That's why the psalmist David said in Psalm 119 and verse 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You've got to take the message and the subject and the doctrine of divine healing and you've got to move it just past the intellectual. Everything's received intellectually. It starts there, comes through the ears, into the mind. But the Bible says it has to get into your heart. That's speaking of your spirit, man. If you want the power of God to genuinely work in your life, you've got to move it from just a place of intellectual assent, and you've got to hide the word of God in your heart. That's why the psalmist said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, my Lord and my Redeemer. You know, one of the individuals that private messaged me this week, I think is a new Christian, uh, but she said in her message how she had struggled with so many various things. Many of them were attacks of the mind. Emotional attacks, oppression, discouragement, depression, uh, narcolepsy. And she went down a whole long list of things that she was battling with. Young lady, if you're listening to me right now, whatever was in your past life has no right to live in your new life in Christ Jesus. For when you came to faith in Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Old things passed away, and all things become new. So when you became a Christian, give no place to the enemy. When you pray, you tell the devil out loud, you have no more right to depression in my life, no more discouragement, no more suicidal thoughts. In Jesus' name, no more narcolepsy. If you're watching this broadcast right now, thou foul spirit of narcolepsy, I bind you in the name of Jesus and I command you to loose that daughter of the Lord right now and I cast you out of her life. Your power to hold and to whisper doubt and unbelief, I curse you by the name of Jesus. I command you to leave that place in her life. Father, I ask you right now by the Holy Spirit, close that gate in her life. And never again may those curses of the devil ever come back or whisper doubt and unbelief into her heart. In the name 
of Jesus. And I pray that for all that are watching, that by the Holy Spirit and by the teaching of the Bible, that right now the finger of God would touch every topos, every place, every doubt, every unbelief, every open gate in their life. May they be closed right now by the power of the teaching of the integrity of the Bible. May the Holy Spirit seal it with fire. Set angels round about the children of the Lord. No sickness, no disease, no infirmity, no plague, no COVID-19, no coronavirus, no work of the devil shall dwell in our lives. We cast it out by the power of salvation. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, Isaiah said, we were healed. In the name of Jesus, let the healing fire of God go out from this broadcast. And we again set a watch at every home. Psalm 91, no plague shall come nigh their dwelling. Not one person in Jesus' name. I pray that this blessing of God and that their words would never betray the prayer. That they'll stay in health, soundness of mind all the days of their life. Proverbs 4 said, listen to my words. Let them penetrate deep into your heart, your spirit. Let them bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. In Mark eleven twenty three 23 and 24, Jesus said this. He said, those things that you say shall be done. Well, let's close. James chapter 1. I want you to have this marked in your Bible if you don't. James chapter 1. It's there in the end of your New Testament. Go down to verse 5. This is what some of you need to pray. Because some of you, this is new teaching, and uh, you're on one of those outer rings in your understanding of it, but God's going to move you every day closer. You're going to see greater increases in miracles, healings, the supernatural power of God in your life. But here's what you need to pray. You can literally pray this. The Bible says in James 1, chapter 1, verse 5, If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and He will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking, but when you ask Him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. There's that co-equal that we were talking about earlier. You can't have anything co-equal to what God has said and who God is. Be sure when you ask Him that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver for a person with divided loyalty is is out is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Now let me just pause right there. You heard me say in this broadcast that I'm not going to answer the question, you know, why did so-and-so die? Why did a godly person die? Why did, you know, my pastor prematurely suffer loss? The reason why, and I could, I just don't have time because there's no one answer to that. The Bible is full of multiple reasons why. This is just one of them. Notice it. The Bible said, James chapter 1, such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Why? Because their loyalty is divided between God and the world. Back to that co-equal teaching. You don't know what to believe because you heard the Bible teaches this and you've got it in your intellect. Well, Brother Tiff taught us this and the Bible says this and you've got it here in your intellect, but at the same time, you still have all your questions. And both of them, the things of God and the things of the world, you've allowed both of those to sit in the throne of your intellect. 
it can't get, the power of God can't get from the intellect to the heart until you settle the score with God in faith. God, I lift your word and the integrity of the Bible over everything that happens, even if I don't understand it. I, from this day forward, am going to trust God. Now, does that mean we live in denial? No. You've heard me say it multiple times. Jesus died on the cross for real sin, died on the cross for real sickness. So if a believer gets into a position where they're battling with sickness, disease, or infirmity, here's what you must do. Number one, you must believe in your heart that just as salvation is available to every sinner, healing is available to every believer. But you have to lay healing upon that visualization of the target, and you have to ask the Holy Spirit to show you where on those rings am I living? Where is my faith? Where is my knowledge of the Word? Because if you still have doubts and questions in your heart, then you handcuff the power of divine healing. Because what did the Bible say? He said, if you're wavering, such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord because their loyalty is divided between God and the world. They are unstable in everything that they do. All right, let's close. Here it is. Don't miss it. If you were to come down with a disease or a sickness or infirmity, you don't walk around saying, I'm not sick, I'm not sick, I'm not sick. We're not Christian scientists. Jesus died for real sickness. But instead of saying things like, I'm afraid I'm going to die, you say things like, thank you, Father, that the Bible said with long life you'll satisfy me. Thank you, Father, that the Bible said I will live and not die. Thank you, Father, that you said it's the enemy that comes to steal, kill, and destroy, not you. And so I trust you, Father, because you said I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Thank you, Father, that as I'm walking through this infirmity, I will not succumb. I will be healed because the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead quickens my mortal body. Thank you, Father, that you said in Psalm 34, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers me out of them all. Thank you, Father, that you said in John 16 and 33, In this world you shall have tribulations, but I should be of good cheer, for you have overcome the world. Thank you, Father, that you said, Greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. And so the power of the resurrected Christ, my Lord and Savior, I command sickness, disease, and infirmity in my body to shrivel up and die, and I shall walk in healing all the days of my life. You see, you don't say, well, you know, everybody on my dad's side of the family, they all die of coronaries usually by the time they hit 60. Well, you know, diabetes runs in our family. Well, you know, my grandmother and, 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 and her mother and, and her mother before that, and you know, they all had mental problems. A couple of them actually lived in the state infirmity. There's a little crazy that runs on our side of the family. And people talk like that. I was in a church one time, and after the service, a mother was bundling up her three little kids in the foyer. I didn't mean to hear it. I just happened to walk by, and I heard that mother say about this time of the year, I hate this time of the year. All my kids will have the flu before it's all said and done. Well, let not that man or woman whose words waver against what God's covenant has said think that they'll receive anything from the Lord. You can be a believer and a follower of the Lord and ready for heaven, but never receive miracle power. Never walk in the supernatural. Never win one battle over sickness, disease, or infirmity. Or you can be a believer who today says, I choose this day 
to lift the Bible above all life's experiences and declare, I believe the word of God above all my carnal, natural-minded understanding and declare God's word cannot lie. And then as you learn the Bible, pray the Bible. Find out what the Bible has to say about what you're going through and live in the power of God. If you believe it and receive it wherever you're at, say a big amen or type something there in the comment section as a token of your faith that you receive it today in the name of Jesus. Uh, just before I pray, if you're not right with God, if you're not living ready to meet the Lord, will you receive Christ today? How does a person receive Christ? The Bible says you have to believe in your heart. You have to repent of your sin. You have to believe that God loves you and will take you just the way you are. Will you pray this prayer with me? Just say, Heavenly Father, today in Jesus' name, I want to be right with God. I repent of my sin. God, you know everything I have ever done. But today, in childlike faith, I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus. And I receive salvation. And as I receive salvation, I receive that same work. For by His stripes I'm healed. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Today I receive Christ and I receive salvation. And by the promise of God, today I'm saved. I am delivered. I am healed. And I vow I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.